why does this thing still fool people? Why, after all these years, can we read this and think, oh yeah, pretty good anthropology. That makes sense. Somebody trying to study these weird people, this tribe off in the distance. Or as one person put it on the comments for YouTube, that totally sucks. I'm looking for information on this tribe, it sucks. Which is to say they're hoping to find these exotic weird people out there and they're disappointed that we don't have information and understanding of the tribe. So why is it that people still expect this to be good anthropology? What it has to do with is the way in which anthropology came to be and the way in which all of our academic disciplines in fact came to be, most of the things that you study. Anthropology is a relatively recent field and it was born during a time of not the first wave of colo European colonialism, but what we might call the latter, the, the second or third wave of European and US colonialism from the late 19th century into the early 20th century. So about 100, 150 years ago to 100 years ago is when anthropology emerges as an academic discipline. And this is a time when we see an expansion of European territories, an expansion of the United States, and an expansion basically of uh, control uh, by what we might call the West or the North Atlantic uh, territories over other places. And at the time, during this time, was perhaps a heyday of a hierarchy where people believed that the races of the world were arranged in a kind of order. And it was a kind of heyday also, or a, a high point, of what was called scientific racism, the idea that certain people were more evolved or less evolved than others. There was also a hierarchy of ethnocentrism. So we talked about ethnocentrism as being that natural human instinct to think that your way of life was the right way and other ways of life were not as good or not, not equally human. But in this case, it is the fact that certain peoples put their way of life as the only acceptable way of life and try to impose that way of life forcibly upon other peoples and to eliminate the practices and customs that they would be that they would encounter and in some cases eliminate the people who were practicing those customs. This was also the same time when you have the consolidation of what we call the social sciences in academia, the rise of political science, of sociology, of economics, of history, be, history, historians were already there, but being incorporated into the university as something you had to take and something you had to understand. Like I said, anthropology was one of the later disciplines to arise. It's more one of the more recent ones, but this is a time when universities are expanding in the Euro US and in Europe, and they are starting to form these different areas of study. So we talked about in the last class that anthropology, the roots of it are simply the study of humans. And I showed you this book by Eric Wolf, just simply called Anthropology, in which he claims that anthropology is the most scientific of the humanities and the most humanistic of the sciences. And his basic claim is that anthropology is an academic discipline, which as we talked about, incorporates holistically all of these different fields in order to study humans. But we should be clear that when anthropology begins, it is the privilege of some humans to study other humans. 
That is to say, it's some people studying other people. It's not simply everybody studying everybody. And in Eric Wolf's later book, which was actually the first anthropology book that I ever read, called Europe and the People Without History, was a time in which he detailed what exactly had happened here. Now, when he said, this title is actually supposed to be ironic. He does not think that there are people without history, but he is talking about the history in which certain types of people came to see themselves as having history, the Europeans and people in North America, and they saw other people as sort of outside of history or not far along enough in their historical development. And so this was a criticism or a critique of that system of power and explanation for how it had developed. Because if you look at what people were thinking about at the time in this time period, the late 19th century, just after the publication of Darwinian ideas, there was this idea that we in the United States and in Europe, we're part of the civilized part of humanity. That word civilization, very charged word. And that people out there in other places were either barbaric or primitive or backward. And this was technically described as a unilinear or unilineal, a one-line theory of evolution. The idea that all of the world's peoples were on a scale they were all going somewhere, and we were trying to get them to be civilized if you were from these places. And so at the time, it was people in these societies that considered themselves civilized, that considered themselves to be academics, who were in this case going out to study other people. So in the last class, I showed you the work of uh, Michel Rolf Trouillot one of my mentors in anthropology who impressed upon us the need for an interconnected global perspective that includes everyone. But again, Trouillot is detailing, in fact, how anthropology had not really lived up to this promise. His most famous essay and the one that begins this book is an essay called Anthropology and the Savage Slot. And what Trio was critiquing here is this idea or this, uh, this category that had been created in the West, in Europe and the United States, states, which confined everyone else to the slot or the category of the savages. And so for anthropology, the question that was posed or the question that people had was, hey, we are civilized. We have these, we, we have these, all this stuff. Why are other people the way they are? Why are they like that? And that was the question that was basically assigned to anthropology as a discipline. At the time, there were some two prevalent explanations sometimes combined together, one of which was racial determinism. Well, other people were the way they were because of their biology, physical makeup, genetics, inheritance. That's why people had different forms of capacities. The other explanation, people were the way they were because of their physical or geographical environment. In my own heritage, I remember my great grandfathers, one on each side. I was growing up, and my uh, one of my uh, nephews, uh, is, he was adopted from South Korea as an infant, and my great grandfather was watching this infant start to crawl around. And this puzzled look comes over his face and he says, now when, 
When he starts to talk, is he going to start talking in English or in Korean? And I mean, hopefully that seems absurd to us now that this is not an issue. But at the time, there was this idea that your phenotype, your physical appearance sort of determined how you might talk. And so you'd be measuring people's tongues and measuring their heads and measuring their larynxes to figure out why people did the way they did. On the other side, I grew up this idea that's like, well, we have to plan for the winter. But down there, there's bananas and they just grow all the time. So they don't have to plan anything. Scary, also racist too, but that's this idea that our physical environment determines the kind of society we would have. So anthropology seemed pretty good as a, as a way of trying to sort of answer these questions, right? Because they started out doing physical anthropology, what we now call biological anthropology. And they also did this material remains study of archeology span so they could talk to us about how people were influenced by their climate and their materials and their level of different kinds of technology. And in the last class, I talked to you about how anthropology integrated and was, it's important that, that anthropology integrates these different aspects of human life into one holistic integrated field. We need that. But it strikes me that in some ways, anthropology was kind of, it just happened to be by accident that they're holistic in the sense that everybody assumed that only in our society do we have economics and political science and history. But since we're the only ones that have it, there's no reason to study the, the economics of other societies. No reason, they don't have it. They don't have a history, just let the anthropologists do it. They can put it all together in this thing. And so, you know, I mean, again, I think it's very important that anthropology does do biological anthropology, that we do archeology, span that we do all of these things and try to put them all together. But it was probably in some ways based on the assumption that in our society, we split ourselves into these spheres and we can study things like religious studies, whereas in other societies, they just have you know, goofy beliefs and magic, no reason to study them very much. One of the key people to challenge this legacy, especially in the United States, was the German Jewish immigrant Franz Boas, who is considered to be the founder uh, of US academic anthropology. Uh, this is a book called Race, Language, and Culture, which collected some of Boas's essays. He began his life, in fact, as a, as a person who was studying physics and was up in uh, up in, in the North Arctic region. And he actually believed at the time that your physical environment would have a lot to do with your society. But what he found was as he was, he was in the Arctic is that even in a very harsh and similar uh, physical environment, the cultural groups and the different beliefs and ideas could be quite different from each other. So he, sort of abandoned the idea of environmental determinism. And he also began to question ideas of racial determinism and racial superiority. And um, he wrote a, a famous study. He actually was also a, a, he was measuring heads at people who were coming into Ellis Island as immigrants, uh, people from, from Sicily, from Eastern Europe, and at the time, people were very concerned about, in the United States, people were concerned about these, uh, these European immigrants from places that were considered to be inferior to the North. And what he found was is that the form of people's heads and bodies actually varied uh, between generations as they arrived in the United States. And so the idea that one's body type, head shape, head form was fixed was obviously wrong, that in fact it was influenced by the food you were eating and the place you were growing up and even the kinds of ways that people were swaddled in their cribs and things like that. 
it's still in some ways it's still a controversial study today because people don't want to believe that but what he was saying was is that there isn't a necessary connection between race and language like we just saw there you can grow up if you grow up in a certain society you're going to naturally or you're going to incorporate that into your life there isn't any connection between race language and culture that these are separate things and so to the question of why people behave think act differently Anthropology would eventually say it's because of our learned behavior. It's because of our culture. It's not in our bones or genes, blood, all that good stuff. And so there are two main parts to the culture concept, borrowing this from uh, Truyo's work. The first, that human behavior does have patterns. It's not just willy nilly, we inherit things. And then we think about them and we come, we have social patterns. As Ruth Benick says, the patterns of culture. But crucially, if those patterns are learned, we learn them. Now, we don't learn them in school. I mean, we learn a lot of things in school. We learn them growing up because the human body and our minds are very, are, are very adaptable now. So what it means is we are not determined by our biology or genetics. Now, again, that doesn't mean that biology isn't important. Of course, our biological differences and similarities are important. And we're not determined by our physical environment. And again, that doesn't mean the physical environment isn't important. Of course, it matters if you can grow corn or wheat or bananas and how you can trade things around if you have access to, to the ocean or not. But that doesn't determine the way that we think, believe, act. And if you look at people in very similar physical environments or very similar uh, physiques, uh, you'll find a wide variety of different things that they say, do, think, and believe. And so what anthropology began to argue against is to argue against this idea that certain people have it the right way that their way of life is the right way and that other people's way of life should be eliminated. And against the hierarchical idea of race, that the races were arranged in some sort of order from best to worst or civilized to primitive, those are things that anthropology began to challenge and to speak out against based on their field work with other societies, uh, and studies that were done. And so uh, Ruth Benedict here, like I said in the last class, wrote a best-selling book called The Patterns of Culture. And one of her points uh, that sometimes gets, gets quoted on her, uh, she made it onto a postage stamp once, um, but this was something that uh, she said in various ways you may not be able to find the exact quote, but it's basically that what anthropology is up to is to try to make the world safe for human differences, to make a space for other kinds of thinking, believing, without trying to eliminate them or put them into our own boxes. And so, uh, there's a, a, a book that came out a couple years ago. I've sometimes considered assigning it to, uh, to intro class. It's not by an anthropologist, it's by, uh, a, uh, by Charles King, and it's called Gods of the Upper Air, How a Circle of Renegade Anthropologists Reinvented Race, Sex, and Gender in the 20th Century. And so he's basically going into the work of Franz Boas and how the ideas that race was fixed and determinate, that how he was fighting those ideas of being of, of racial determinism and of the ethnocentrism of the time. Boas also was important in training, as we just saw, Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead, who had become the most famous anthropologist in the United States wrote a book called Coming of Age in Samoa, which 
everybody had to read at the time to sort of challenge the idea that sexuality was the same all over the world. Also worked with uh, people like Zora Neale Hurston, who we may know from uh, her writings, uh, other indigenous collaborators, people from Native American societies like Ella Cara Deloria, George Hunt, were collaborators in this work that Boaz was up to. And as Charles King puts it, reinvents the way that people thought about race, sex, and gender as something that was given or set for all time or the same everywhere to what we probably now, most of us think of it today as something that we learn to do culturally. Picture of Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, a, this was from a PBS special. You know, a, a writer. We know her most as, as a writer, uh, a folklorist. And in this case, they say that she is an anthropologist. Um, and in fact, some of her earliest work was or going out uh, that, to study the lives of uh, African-Americans. Um, but as they say here, she was uh, one of the most celebrated figures of the Harlem Renaissance, but died in obscurity. And I put that out there to say that although I would love to simply celebrate the legacy of Boazian anthropology, it was limited or it didn't go as far as enough as it could have gone. So Franz Boaz talked to and gave lectures with W.E.B. Du Bois, the famous author, The Souls of Black Folk, but he really didn't embrace Du Bois's ideas and anti-racism. And Zora Neale Hurston never became an academic anthropologist. She was in some ways pushed out of the discipline. So although there were certain ideas that the, the Boazians talked about to try and reshape American society, they really didn't go as far as other people were going at the time in order to fight the predominant racism of American society. Boaz also participated in some rather ugly episodes of collecting bones from graves, removing artifacts. You go to the uh, Museum of Natural History in New York City, you'll see stuff that was taken from native communities. And in general, it's, you know, I mean, he was arguing for better treatment, but they, there was a, a, a mass mistreatment of indigenous peoples, especially Native Americans at the time, and anthropologists, including Baz, were, were involved in that. And so for the most part, uh, you know, as anthropology became a, an academic discipline, people started to want to have their academic positions and be professors and get PhDs and get money. And so how do you do that? Well, you say, hey, we're the ones who study culture and we're the only ones who can tell you about those strange people out there. And so instead of fighting against the idea of the savage and uh, fighting against the idea of hierarchies, anthropologists did do this, but they in fact, in some ways, recreated that idea or became the ones at least formally who sought to have control over those spots. There were famous female anthropologists, like I said, Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict were very popular, best-selling people, but in the universities, they were often marginalized. They were pushed out. They didn't get huge university positions um, there as well. So there was, a, you know, I mean, Boaz himself did dis experience anti-Semitic discrimination within anthropology. A lot of people were against his training of people who looked different. But at the same time, we do have to acknowledge that anthropologists and anthropology did not go as far as it could have or did not realize the potential that, uh, that, that, it, that it could have realized. 
So I say that to come back to the Naki Rainbow and my issues, or we may call our issues with reading it, which is to say the Naki Rainbow simply flips over the us and the them, right? So they look, we look weird to them, they look weird to us, yay. But it does not talk about how, in fact, our societies are deeply interpenetrated and interconnected and historically linked. And in particular, if you think about the American people in the United States and what happened, we have a whole society which was based upon the elimination and displacement of indigenous peoples. And now we're gonna come back and talk about medicine man and witch doctors and all these tribal stereotypes. Very uncool, actually, very uncool. Because you know you have a whole society that was, that, that was built upon the removal of indigenous peoples from their land. And uh, we're gonna come back and just play games and name our sports teams after them and hoop and holler. It also portrays a group, which we should never do, as homogeneous, as I say, everybody in the society is the same. It doesn't portray a range of variation, which happens in every society, which happens in our own and happens in others, and they get frozen in time. And so this is a problem for many anthropological studies. It's why I asked you always to look at what year it was and how, how they are being examined, because we do not want to try and put people in frozen time boxes where everybody's the same. We wouldn't want them to do it to us. And we don't want to do to other people. But the main problem is, is that ethnocentrism is usually not just, oh, I wear a red hat, he wears a blue hat. We're all, you know, everybody's weird to each other. Almost always there's some form of power and inequality so that somebody is trying to impose their way of life or, putting down somebody else's way of life. So whenever we think about things like ethnocentrism and trying to understand others, we always have to think about the potential power and inequality that is involved in that. And this certainly applies when we're thinking about the United States and our relationship with the indigenous societies, our relationship uh, uh, between uh, the, uh, the, the things that the United States was built on, um, our history of, of enslavement. Uh, we have to be very careful to, when we're unpacking those kinds of things, uh, not, to, not to forget that kind of history. So what can we learn from this? In the last class, I said that we needed to have a discipline that incorporated, incorporated how we are biologically, our material culture, our technology, and our culture and language beliefs. But if we're gonna do that, we have to make sure we include everyone. If we're going to solve, or if we're going to make a dent in the human problems, the human issues, the climate crisis, the health crisis, crisis of racism and social injustice, we have to be inclusive of everyone. We can't simply perpetuate the elitist tendencies uh, that have too often been perpetuated. 